Okay, so welcome to Thursday. Um, just a couple of quick announcements that next week we're going to be talking about explainability and interpretability. I'm psyched for that. There'll, there will be one reading that you have to do for Tuesday, and there's one video you need to watch for Thursday. I'll get those up later today. Um, the first talk is going to be uh, from a friend in Israel, and the second one is from a, a colleague who's looking at medical explainability from Europe. Um, on that note, when I was at Borealis uh, doing AI for the Royal Bank of Canada, we worked on RL for stock trading, and there was an explainability component that I wasn't really supposed to talk about because it wasn't public until yesterday when they just had a press release saying, hey, we're doing RL for stock trading. So I, I can't go into any, any confidential details, but um, I'll, after either during or after these two talks, I'll bring up some of my experience relating to um, explainability on a real world product and the difference between expectations and what you actually produce. Uh, when when you are working in time constrained environments with real people. Uh, so with that, um, I hope you enjoyed the videos. I thought those were really cool that Carrie gave us a way to kind of think about this huge intelligent tutoring system uh, system space. So today we can have a bit of discussion about that. She was also kind enough to read through your proposals and she has given um, concrete suggestions on PDFs, which I am going to also add my comments to and get back to you today or tomorrow. Uh, and But today we'll also talk a little bit about some, some general advice that she has uh, because um, she knows a whole lot more about doing human user studies than I do. And because this is, especially since I said before, this is my first time doing the class, the, my first time trying to get these kind of proposals from students, um, it's it's a learning experience for me. So she has graciously offered to help, help us with that. So I'm super excited about that. So with that, I'll just say that um, Carrie runs the Ed Tekla Research Group here. Hopefully you've you have met her. If if you have not met her, she is someone I would suggest going out of your way to interact with because she's she's awesome. Um, I'll and then I'll end by saying that um, she received her PhD in 2016 and is an expert in human computer interaction, intelligent tutoring systems, AI. So it's super exciting to have her in this class. So why don't I hand it over to Carrie now? Thank you, Matt. Um, so I have an issue with defining people as experts. So we're just gonna pretend that I'm not. Everyone has expertise in different levels for different things. Um, and I have, because I have backgrounds that relate to cognitive science, I have a very strict definition of expert. <laughs> Um, so we'll just ignore that for now though. What I wanted to do was give you a bit of a sense of who I am and how I came to be here. So I'm going to start with my path from my undergrad kind of up to today. So I did my undergrad starting in computer science at the University of Saskatchewan. And then I took this course and I decided I want to be fluent in every, in one language from every language family. And there are seven. So I wound up doing a double degree with Russian and computer science. So I went to school in Russia for a bit, um, stayed in Canada. The whole time I was coaching. Um, so I coached, I used to coach synchronized swimming. So I was coaching at various levels from Special Olympics to national team throughout that process. Um, and as one of my summer jobs, I wound up working on this system that was meant to help people learn. And I was, the U of S is kind of a weird and special place and its computing science department is because they do a lot of experimental work with learning technologies. So I kind of just fell into the area I'm in. We were always guinea pigs as undergrads with all of these new systems. Um, the main one that we used was called iHelp and it was agent based. And in the initial version, the agents would negotiate whether or not you were available to help another student who in theory, you had the expertise to help. So it had this peer mentoring model and matching through agent negotiation. And so I later joined that team and worked on some of their instructional systems and that kind of thing. And that transitioned me into my master's. So the three faculty on that team were Yulita Vasilova, Jim Greer and Gord McCalla. And I've worked with each of them in different capacities. So I did my undergrad thesis with Yulita. And that was more of a social um, 
social computing system and exploration of how interface elements basically communicate whether or not a system is open to different groups participation. So we were looking specifically at gender divides and inclusion in CS, but the basic idea is that the design of system features encourages or discourages people to participate. So we were looking at issues around that. Um, with Jim Greer, I did a whole bunch of work on these systems. That was all paid work. He convinced me to come work for him in the summers. He's kind of a hard guy. He was a hard guy to say no to. He's offering you money to come do the kind of stuff you like to do. Um, and then I worked with Gord for my master's. And the great thing about Gord is he, get, he gives his students so much freedom. So as long as it in any way related to educational technology, he was on board. <laughs> so he basically let me combine my undergrad foci of computer science and Russian into a system. So I built a system to help people learn how to pronounce Russian. We didn't have NLP classes at UCAS, like nothing. <laughs> um, so I had to go learn speech synthesis and all of that and get that up and going and build a system that we then integrated into the Russian program at the university. So I got to do that, which is really, really cool. And I, I'm forever grateful to Gord. He's actually still a really great mentor when I have problems. He has such a great perspective on the world that I can always go back to him. But I finished that and I went to the University of Toronto to do my PhD. And my main goal during my PhD was to learn a lot of research methods. Um, I did it in computer science, but what I wound up doing was I volunteered for three summers in a psychology lab to learn about how to assess things like knowledge how to run studies. Even though I had training um, during my master's and my undergrad on research methods, I still went and did that. I went over to medicine to learn about qualitative research methods and took courses over there. I took courses in education, linguistics, socio um, sociolinguistics, pragmatics to learn about research methods in those, both qualitative and quantitative. I also took courses in psychometrics and that's the study of how we measure cognitive aspects of people, things that we can't directly observe and how we can do that. Um, so I did all that work and I, it was technically in an HCI group, but I was doing a whole bunch of education stuff as well. Um, more than half of my coursework was actually in the College of Education, even though I was doing additional work in um, computer science as well, a lot of natural language processing type courses. And when it came time to being done, so the U of T has a double defense process. <laughs> you defend in the department and you only get to go to your graduate studies defense if you pass your internal defense. Um, and they do that so that they don't get embarrassed when people fail at graduate studies. <laughs> it works, it's fine. Um, so that first defense is actually the way scarier one. <laughs> They're way tougher on you, super hard, but it was okay. So I was interviewing for postdocs around the time that I was doing that and I had two options. One was to remain in Canada and go work with another HCI group where it would have built up my network here, but I didn't think it was going to expand my network as much as it could. The other was to go to the University of Pittsburgh in the Learning Research Development Center. And I'm a computer scientist that probably doesn't sound like a straightforward path that most people would choose. Um, but I chose it because LRDC is a really cool place and honestly, it was the first place in my research career where I felt like I belonged. So everyone else was a freak like me. <laughs> LRDC consists of people from law, psychology, education, policy, medicine, computer science. And there's not a single project there that I've ever seen where there aren't at least two disciplines represented. Usually it's three or four of those disciplines represented. So for me, it was really a great place to be. I could combine my linguistics knowledge and work. So I worked with a psycholinguistics lab as well as a natural language processing group and an HCI group. Um, it was a really weird position too because it was half in the research center and then half in the university's teaching and learning center. So I was taking my research and applying it in actual university courses and then collecting data in those courses as well. So it was this really nice mishmash of everything I could have possibly wanted um, in a postdoc. So that was really good for me. Um, and then of course I applied for jobs and wound up here. So I originally grew up in Saskatchewan. So from a location perspective, U of A was as close to home as I could possibly get other than the University of Saskatchewan. That's the only place that's physically closer. Um, 
So it's nice from that perspective, but one of the reasons I liked the U of A um, was really because there's such deep AI expertise. And that's a, the reason a lot of people here are actually here, a lot of the students. Um, so while I do some AI, I wouldn't call that my core contribution. I use AI. I don't really develop AI algorithms. I look at applications of it and specifically for learning. So for me, that was a great opportunity because then I could focus on the learning and the HCI components because there are other people who are willing to collaborate and that makes things really great. So I get to again, be the weird person, but I'm the weird person who people like because I bring something, I can bring something to their projects that they don't necessarily have and they can bring things to mine. And that's a really nice position to be in. So that's basically how I wound up here. Are there questions about that? Do you collaborate with people in, in education at U of A? Yeah, I do. Um, mostly with the people who do um, in the educational psychology groups. Mm -hmm. We have a, the Center for Research and Assessment and Measurement in Education, CRAME. Um, one of their faculty, Maria Kutimisu, she'd done her master's and I think PhD um, in our department. She's now over there. So she has a cross appointment, but I also work with Okan Bulut and a few other psychometrics people. We just submitted a grant together. Um, and then there are a few people in the regular education. I don't remember the departments in our education school because they're a little different from what I'm used to. Um, they're organized more by level than by topic. And uh, I have a collaboration with someone in policy over there too, I guess. I just make friends with people. That's the short version. I go over to medicine. I, <laughs> you just work with people. It's all good. Nice. So I know Matt had sent me some questions about um, the different videos. I think I'll probably go through the ITS video questions you sent, Matt, and then open it up to students for additional questions, because I think your questions might help alleviate some people's issues. <laughs> okay, so one of the questions that Matt sent me or suggested that I do is talking about effect size and scaffolding. So effect size is basically, it's a measure of the size of a difference between two things. That's all it is. So if you're running a t-test, you can come out with the statistics that's the effect size. Now, I know in the video I talked about it as it's basically the proportion of the standard deviation that is accounted for. Um, but really, it's just a measure of the magnitude of the difference or of the effect. So if you have two groups doing different things, the effect size is how much of the performance can be accounted for based on that difference. When reporting, when you're, anytime you're doing a statistical test, an inferential test, you should be reporting effect size. The specific measure changes from effect size to effect size. But in addition to that, for reporting, make it meaningful to the reader because an effect size of 0.79, completely useless to you. You have to do all of this other work to make sense of it. So if it, let's say um, you're talking about performance time, how long it takes someone to complete a task. You report the statistic for the effect size, but then you can say this is around five seconds faster. That's all you have to do, and you've made it that much easier for your reader. So that is something I strongly recommend, and that I know I think that's in the APA guidance for reporting statistics. I love I love that we should always report effect size. I'm still trying to get uh, writers in AI to uh, do statistical um, say whether their yeah. differences are statistically significant. Yeah, that's a whole separate. There are disciplinary differences for standards around these things. And there are actually communities where they argue you shouldn't be doing statistical testing and you should be providing things like the confidence interval so that the reader can do more interpretation and make those inferences themselves. So there are community standard differences, but you definitely shouldn't be looking at say your F measure or your precision measure and it's 0 0.01 higher, just if you look at the raw numbers, and then make an assumption about the difference because that might not actually be a real difference. It might not be a measurable difference. It could be random. Do you think it's worth um, going into what power analysis is or is that too much of a tangent? <laughs> um, I don't know that we wanna go into power analysis. 
Okay. Um, if you don't, so I, I can do a bit of a high level. So power is basically kind of a high level way of figuring out if your study design is good enough to find differences. So if you don't find differences, you can look at the statistics you have and figure out whether or not your study was underpowered for the number of participants you had. Study design, it takes a lot of variables into account. And that's why I don't wanna go into it in detail. Um, but it's based on things like how many participants you have, how you set up the study. So it's, in, it's inherently linked to your methods, um, not just the statistical methods, but the actual data collection methods. Um, if you've done pilot studies though, and ideally we all do this, sometimes we don't do it, let's be honest. <laughs> sometimes it's just not something we do. Um, sometimes it's not necessarily feasible. What you can do is you can take the effect size from your pilot study and use that to estimate the number of participants you'll need for your design, given a power that you want to achieve. So you can take all of those variables into account. And I use G power to do this. It's just a software package. There are a bunch out there. G power is just a really commonly used one. Um, and I'll do that for sample size estimation. And if you want to be like really uptight about transparency and methods and stuff, you can even pre-register your studies. So you've done all of this work ahead of time, you pre-register them, you hide them so that they aren't visible for the peer review process. But I honestly think that's part of why we got, it um, was part of the reason behind why we got uh, best paper nomination is because we'd done that process. So it shows a level of rigor and it's not that you can't ever change anything after you may make adjustments and then you log them and that and you report them and that's okay. But it really gets people talking and thinking about the design and how we want to be as a community around research transparency and methods. I don't think pre registration has really come to AI yet it's only really kind of coming to the educational technology people In psychology it's a really big thing now or it's becoming a really big thing. And there are journals where you do your full study design, you submit it for pre, you pre-register, you submit it for pre-review, and they you go through that process and you get it accepted before you've collected any data. So then as long as your analysis is in data collection is consistent with what was accepted, it gets published. So that way, if you have negative results, so results where there isn't a significant difference, it's the work still gets out there. And then we're all learning about what isn't working. And that makes all of our knowledge better because when we're looking at things like meta-analyses that combine evidence from multiple studies to show real effects, because you can't rely on any one study usually for that, um, we have all of the negative evidence as well. So we're getting a better representation and a more truthful essentially representation of what the effect of something actually is. Other questions around effect sizes, because I know I've just bombarded you with a ton of information. Yeah, because that's that's something we we really don't talk about in AI at all or in machine learning. Um, and I wonder if I uh, can convince Adam White that it's worth at least mentioning in his empirical RL class in the winter, because it seems like something that people should at least know about. Yeah. In fairness to RLAI, HCI only reports effect sizes. And I don't even think everyone really does it. So I'm, I, I think this is a problem with CS as a, as a discipline as a whole, not necessarily for specific sub areas. HCI is good for doing the statistical testing aspect, mainly because of the psych background and the interdisciplinary, you can't get away with not doing something like that. Um, but it's the interdisciplinary that interdisciplinarity that has pushed it forward methodologically. And I think, I think this does directly play into Scott's questions about um, could there be a rep, rec, a problem uh, replicating experiments in AI? And I, I have some pretty strong opinions about that. Carrie, do you, do you have opinions about rec, replicating experiments in AI? I think generally we need more replication. I think AI ML does a bit of this. In fairness, I think it's one of the areas where replication is better in computer science. And part of that is because in order to show that your algorithm is better, your new thing is better, you have to run the previous ones on some set of data. 
Now we can talk about the qualities of that data and how realistic any of that data is and whether or not it'll generalize to a real world application. And those, those are all real problems that need to be done. But I'd like to actually give AI credit for doing some attempt at replication where it's missing almost everywhere else in computer science even in HCI outside of one specific type of task that's been done so many times. And it's almost like the most boring task in the world. It's literally tapping back and forth. It is the worst. If you've ever participated in a study, it's the worst thing to do, honestly. Yeah. So if um, I know Joelle Pinot has been uh, talking for a few years about um, how we need to do this better. And so, so more and more people are releasing their data more and more people are releasing their algorithms, their code, but it is still the case that I had um, two different students over in the past few months try to download other people's code and spend over two months just trying to replicate their results, <laughs> let alone actually understand the code and build on it. So just because someone gives you their software doesn't mean it's actually useful, but you're right, it, it could be worse. Yeah. I, I'm not saying there's a m massive room for growth. Um, even I've had problems with this though. So we had a collaboration where we were doing analysis of MOOC data and we're doing analysis of the forums. Um, I was using code from someone else. We could only analyze our data in our actual location. So I couldn't send in the data. So I had to use his scripts, get them running on my machine. Um, the MOOC provider had changed the databases, <laughs> so the database structure had changed. There were all those kinds of problems that we had to get past. That's fine. We did a paper, published it, whatever. Then we went to replicate it with additional data, and by adding, um, we were going to try some different models. We couldn't repeat our results. So anytime you're doing this kind of thing, write the splits out store them because if you haven't stored the splits, if you're doing any kind of cross-validation, um, you're not gonna replicate. Really simple story. So this was my first study like that. Um, the replication stuff that I tend to more do involves another human study. So you want consistent consistency in the direction of results, but you're not going to get the exact same results because people vary. But as long as your direction and similar magnitudes of results, that's the kind of thing you want to look for in replications when you have humans. If you're using the same data and the same code, you better get the same results. Like we wound up, we just quit the study because we were trying and trying and we couldn't figure it out. And it was like, well, we can't, <laughs> we have zero ground to stand on for this study. So we just left it. And that's life. Stuff goes wrong sometimes. So then the other question related to that, unless there's something else related to this that I'm just not seeing. Okay, so then the other one was scaffolding. Um, <laughs> I probably used this word a lot without even realizing it. <laughs> That's the educator in me. Um, so scaffolding is this idea of giving support to a learner. The basic idea is support. It's the same metaphor as if you have an actual scaffold that you're standing on. What distinguishes how scaffolding gets used in an education context is technically you're supposed to be slowly removing that support until they can do the task without support. It doesn't always get used in that way, but that is technically the definition. So it's support that you phase out on some level. Um, for those of you who might be familiar with Vygotsky in the zone of proximal development, Vygotsky didn't come up with the term scaffolding, it was someone else, but scaffolding is the support he's talking about when he's talking about the difference between what a person can do unsupported and what they can do with support. And that's how the zone of proximal development is defined. I think that was, so I think that covers that unless there are questions around that. It's a subtle thing. like. The, socio, the class I took on this, three hour long class, which is just hard, but an hour and a half in, we took a break. I had a headache, like I was, this is a hard class. It was so difficult from a terminology perspective. Um, it was a mind buster. 
Awesome. It's it's good to know that I've been using the term scaffolding wrong for about the last 10 years. That's, that's uh, good you to know. You and most of the world, it's okay. <laughs> Okay, so anything from students related to the intelligent tutoring systems video? Yeah, I had a question about um, the ITS architectures video. Um, I was just wondering what the difference between a pedagogical model is and a pedagogical module. Um, like what the distinction is, was one of them an interface for the model or? Um, so which one are you specifically looking at? Because my answer may depend on the context in the rest of the slide. Yeah, it's like the very last diagram in the video. Oh yeah, so one of those will be storing information. One's the database and one is the logic that runs it in that case. Um, depending on how they draw it, sometimes those are combined into one thing, um, but one's basically the pedagogical rules and the other is an engine. Thanks. Yep. Uh, hi, Carrie, I have a question. Yep. Um, in at least what Matt shared with us, there was like four examples of intelligent tutoring systems with like some of them being games and stuff. But I noticed that um, they were all, I think, older than from 2015. And I was going to ask, like, what is the current, like, kind of state of the art? Like, who's kind of leading the way in terms of, like, the best tutoring system? Is, like, Coursera, like, something that you think is, like, really good? Um, like, what's your opinion on this stuff? So um, I also chose based on who had videos that explain things reasonably well. Assistment and cognitive tutor. So those were both of the math ones our current state of the art. Even if the video is a little bit older, what they are doing is really top of the line. They are in thousands of schools. Um, they have, Assistments does a really good job and is doing interesting research around supporting teachers and the teacher's process of use. Carnegie Learning, um, so that's the cognitive tutors. They'll actually call and check in with teachers based on what they're seeing in the logs. So they have some really good processes around use. There are some really bad systems out there too that are claiming to be state of the art. Off the top of my head, I can't remember who they are and I probably wouldn't, shouldn't say them anyway since this would be public and that I just don't wanna go there. <laughs> I don't need to make enemies that way. <laughs> um, the Alela one is they are cutting edge all the time. They're always breaking ground um, and they're doing it in a domain that's really, really hard. When you start looking at learning things like culture and language, and they're doing conversational language, they aren't just doing um, yes, no grammar stuff. What they're doing is incredibly hard and they put a ton of effort into this. They even have a village where you physically get avatars who are your size, who are projected onto a screen. It's somewhere, I can't remember what desert in the US, it's somewhere in the desert in the US. <laughs> Um, and you can talk and interact with these agents in a physical life size. So they're trying to go from that. We're playing it in a game. And it's technically a game, but it's really a simulation. Um, they are using, they were using the Unreal Tournament engine initially from the first paper. Like they started this in 2004-ish um, to the point where they're sending troops out and the troops are going and using what they're learning. So most of these systems, like Crystal Island is still actively being researched and they're looking. Um, so what they're, yeah, it's appeared now. I can talk about it. <laughs> um, one of their more recent papers is looking at eye gaze data and looking at measuring cognitive load and, or no, sorry, um, scientific thinking using that and in-game logged activities. They, I think they use a slightly different term, but it's evidence of they're trying to see when students are actually engaging in scientific um, thinking rather than just doing actions that might be indicative of it based on what we can tell about how a user is concentrating from their eye gaze data and like the dilation of their pupils. Yeah, it's, they're doing some really cool stuff. What you're seeing on the surface and what you see in the videos doesn't always highlight the coolest of what they're doing right now because they've just done that study so they haven't integrated it into the system yet. Yeah, maybe um, 
Another point about the, the game related stuff, has there been successful use of VR with it? Because I can imagine that would be like really nice to feel like you're actually in the game. So the Alela one's the closest one. Um, well, I'd say that one's more of an augmented reality than a virtual reality one. Um, I don't pay as much attention to the AR VR stuff. I, I just don't find it interesting. <laughs> I'm not excited by it. Um, and that's my bias. So there could be, but I, I'm not paying attention to it. So I can't say whether or not there is. And there's also the question, how do you even measure state of the art for tutoring systems? So I, I had assumed that, well, so in, in one of your videos, you, you did talk about how there's a lot of discussions about what measurement means and how you can do it. And, but I, I would assume that whatever your measurement definition is, what you are measuring, you would take the old, the old system, take the new system and run similar populations through them and see which works better. Is, is that a, is that a, overly naive view or is it is it really much more than that at a general level that's true but we're getting to the point now where we need to look at not necessarily the population level but which students we're serving and which ones we aren't so um, I think it was Joe Beck one of the Worcester Polytechnic people they had this paper about wheel spinning so anyone who's driven in winter you've gotten stuck and spun your wheels in the snow that's the metaphor they're using to describe the students who in these tutoring systems, and it was all from math based ones, but I expect the same thing in language learning or any other domain where there's correct or incorrect answers for what they're doing, trying to support. Um, where it doesn't matter how long they stay in the system, they plateau and they don't go anywhere. And it's likely because they don't have the prerequisite knowledge, they're missing something. So what they were working on was identifying those students so that teachers could go work with them and make sure that those students are getting the additional support so that maybe the tutoring system can be helpful to them. So it's not necessarily about, yeah, I said state of the art. I actually have a huge problem with that term because <laughs> I just, oh, I, don't, I don't like this extreme language stuff. Um, but like there are features that are state of the art or the cognitive tutoring and assessments, that, that class of tutoring systems are incredibly powerful using a relatively simple modeling approach. Um, so they have this hierarchical organization of the procedures that someone has to apply in math. And they're, it's incredibly fine grained. And based on that, they can determine what kind of misconception you have and give you um, specific instruction based on that. But that approach, like that modeling procedure has been around for decades at this point. But that doesn't mean they're not continually improving on the system and adding new features to support other aspects of learning. And I think that because of how long they've been around, they have a great wealth of data and knowledge that they can do that with. So then one of the other questions that got sent was, do people use different architectures or for different problems? I'm going to assume so. I, I haven't done a full study of the architectures and how people switch between them. What I found is there is a little bit of this. Most of the time though, someone kind of gets into a domain and they stay there. There's a high cost to developing these systems like any expert system. And that's largely where the field came out of was expert systems. There's a lot of overlap there. Um, so people don't generally switch from a cognitive tutoring math to something that's completely different, say in language learning. That doesn't happen a lot. We ha I've seen Vincent Alevin do a bit of a switch between two modeling approaches. And that's because these two modeling approaches, so there's um, constraint-based modeling and Bayesian knowledge tracing. The CMU people for the longest time were strictly Bayesian knowledge tracing. Or I shouldn't say strictly, I'm sure there were some people who didn't, I might be missing some samples. But anything I saw coming out of there um, was doing that. And they have partnerships with the surrounding schools. So they've done all of this research in actual schools, not in lab settings. Um, 
And then you had this group that had people in kind of Chicago and New Zealand doing constraint-based modeling. And they, they got into a bit of a disagreement in articles over the strengths and weaknesses of the other. And since then, Vincent the Laven and them have done some more constraint-based stuff. And essentially, um, you can do constraints or Bayesian knowledge tracing at the granularity. If you get the constraints down to the level, you can get almost the same behavior or the same behavior out of the systems. So then it comes down to the underlying theory from education that you care more about, or that's potentially more a better fit with your domain of instruction. So that, that's really interesting to me because when I was um, doing my postdoc focusing on multi-agent systems, there was one camp of people who were saying, well, you've got to be totally decentralized because centralized approaches don't scale. There was another camp of people who would say, no, that's silly. We can get bigger, bigger computers. We want the best performance. So it has to be centralized. And we were develop. I, I was helping other people uh, develop methods that tried to combine the two where you get, you know, try to get yeah. groups of agents to work together. And then those groups are decentralized that, so there, there's a bunch of ways that you can do that. So when you, when you have these different camps in science, if if they're not uh, if, if they're uh, competing and not collaborating, you you can get into these weird conditions where you have your well. I guess this is true even if you don't have these camps, but you you are incentivized to have your method do the best it can and show it off. It's not necessarily that you want to find out what method is best. That's a fairly cynical way of saying it, though. There's a strategic competence to that, to going that road, though, too. Like, I would probably have a better um, research record if I didn't switch the modeling paradigms I use from project to project <laughs> based on what I feel is a better match with um, the goals of the project it'd be a lot easier and expeditious for me to stay in the same paradigm and keep going that route. Now I've done okay, <laughs> um, but there's a risk to doing that because you can get more done. Your students will ramp up faster if everyone's doing the same, like in the same paradigm, in the same set of methods, it can be a lot more productive. And that our incentive mechanisms are largely around productivity. So that's, that's life. We make choices. We balance the things that we value. So then were there other questions around ITS or architectures? Uh, I have a, another question that's, yeah. um, so I noticed uh, the like the responses that students would enter were usually like quite um, in well-defined boxes or like were just a variety of selections or something like that. But um, commonly in like exams or like midterms or tests, you have more open-endedness maybe, even in math, like you'd have like a kind of longer problem where you'd write then your response and you can write the vectors in different shapes or like it, there'd be more open-endedness. And how or can these tutoring systems address any of this or are the users always confined to like very small like chunks of answers for, for a question? Yeah, um, I can't speak to the math ones. I haven't seen any that do the more open-ended but that doesn't mean that they aren't there. I know there are some for geometry so they'll have drawing in them but I don't know the underlying mechanisms. Um, in language learning there are ones that are far more open-ended especially when you start looking at writing support and that kind of thing. So they'll give you feedback on your argumentation. So you could be entering anything, but what they're doing is identifying the components of your argument and whether or not it's well-structured. So they can give you feedback on that. So I, it really depends on the domain of application. I think part of the reason that we maybe haven't seen the same exploration of that type of data entry, like response entry for math intelligent tutoring systems was when they started, you needed that level of support and structure to make it feasible given the computational power of the time. I think we're at a stage now where we could, we could have kids writing on a tablet 
and do character recognition and identify the key components. What you, if you do that, um, the one challenge is that you won't necessarily get the feedback at the step you got where you made a mistake when you make the mistake. Whereas with these other ones, as you're entering it, they know when you finish that step so they can check to give you feedback. So I think it can get, it'll get better over time and that will be a possibility. I just haven't seen it, but again, I don't, I don't really care about math education. Not that I don't care about kids learning math, but that's not my love. So I don't spend a lot of time on the really detailed aspects that are math, but those are the most um, widely used commercially available systems. Yeah, then maybe one note on that is something that came to my mind is, um, are these, can these systems maybe be used um, in a similar way to um, help mark in, in like university settings and stuff? Because you have all these like TAs and professors maybe marking um, results. And now can you leverage what's being used in like these tutoring systems or can tutoring systems leverage what's already been done in that field? I don't know if there's anything been done though. <laughs> so there's a lot of auto grading work out there. Um, for different domains. it A lot of it started with essay scoring because of tests like the IELTS and the GRE or the TOEFL, where the biggest components and the biggest expense for those beyond item creation, so beyond creating the test itself and making sure that it's a appropriate test and valid, is on the grading side. So grading any of the spoken output or written output. So there's a fair bit of work in those areas because it's there's a commercial drive for it. Yeah, last uh, fall, I got to take a English test for my Canadian permanent residency, and that was auto graded. And I got a 10 out of 12 on writing. And I was so annoyed. I petitioned to be regraded by a person and I got 11 out of 12. So auto graders are not perfect. They're not perfect, but the, um, many of them have been shown to have similar levels of error consistency as the human raters. Um, which test did you do out of curiosity? Um, so there are two tests that you can do, and one of them is written and one of them is typed. So I chose the one that I could use a keyboard and not worry about cramping my hand. I don't remember the name of it. Did you have to do an in-person video or interview? Yes, it was in person. Uh, um, so the, the test was in person, but I had to, the, like the, the speaking section, they gave me a prompt and then I was just supposed to riff on it. There was not a, a person I was actually interacting with. Okay, so it wasn't the IELTS. Yeah. <laughs> so I know the, my language tests. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you'd think you'd be able to say, well, I've published a book. I, I have a PhD from the, no, um, I understand, but I'm still gonna complain about it. Um, there, there's one other question in the chat. So if, if you are, uh, it, it's 2020 and you are doing reinforcement learning research, you are either using uh, OpenAI's gym or you're using something else for some very specific reason. Is there any kind of general framework in, in terms of the actual software and the, the UI that people generally use, or is it all completely customized for ITSs? Yeah, so this is a little tricky. Most of it's customized, although Carnegie Learn or Carnegie Mellon University has made theirs available. So they do a summer school where you can go and pick a stream. One of them is educational data mining, so machine learning. One of them is a cognitive science modeling stream. One is build your course in our system essentially. And then the other is like their simulated students one, which uses the same architecture. So they've made their architecture available for others to use. Most of it is really just labs or groups building their own system though. Cool. So I think we've exhausted the questions. Are there, are there any other ones that people would like to ask? I just want to, I want to be conscious of time and I'm, um, because I'm, I'm really excited to hear Carrie's general comments about um, uh, our, our proposals and I want to make sure we leave enough time for that. 
I had sort of a general question for you, Carrie. Um, with like more advanced ITS systems, when they use like gaze tracking or they record all the different clicks that someone's doing, is there ever a concern for privacy? Like, do you have to ask the users to sign away or, or consent to this? And how does that work if they're like kids and can't provide informed consent? Um, so yeah, this can be a little tricky and it depends a bit on your jurisdiction. So there's the ethical and the legal sides of this. Um, with the clickstream data, because the system needs it to support learning, you don't need consent. You don't need to consent to click it or to collect it because if they don't, if you aren't collecting their responses, you can't actually perform the adaptation and the function of the system itself. Um, now with the video stuff, you can get a bit into that space depending on what's being done. Um, I'm a fan of enabling opt-out, but the reality is, is this is getting integrated into classrooms where the school basically gives consent. For research studies that you have to do the parental consent and that kind of thing, but for system use, the school and the teacher effectively give consent. And in the model where it's used in schools, it's often you'll, let's say you have three math classes a week. One of them will be on the system, the other two will be with the teacher. Or they might have kids who rotate into using the system part-time, some kind of rotation model so that most of their time is actually in the classroom with their fellow students and their teacher, but some of it's on the system. And they found that to be really effective. Um, so from the legal perspective, it's going to vary by jurisdiction. In the US to use the data for anything that is part of a student's education record. And you could argue that any ITS log is part of a student's record if we're using it for assessment. If it's not being used as part of their assessment, then you can, it would no longer be under this law. <laughs> um, if it's not part of their educational record, and you, um, then you, act, you need explicit, I think it even has to be written consent from the parent. When I've done studies that have involved minors, we've used a dual process. So the parents had to give written consent. Every time you're having a session with the kids, they have to give verbal assent. Um, and they get to walk out. Like It is perfectly okay. <laughs> they can walk out of the room. They still get the benefits. You don't actually tell their parents necessarily that they've said no. Um, but you don't get to you don't get in the room with the kid unless you have parental consent. Um, but that was in a Canadian context. When I was in the U.S., I didn't work with kids at all because that required FBI checks and stuff. And I was like, well, I'm not going to be in your database. Before I moved down, they're like, well, you need to get an FBI criminal record check. I was like, do you mean an RCMP one? Because I know I'm not like I can't. E I couldn't even submit my fingerprints for the record check because I wasn't in the U.S. Because you have to go to one of their centers. It's this whole extra thing. Um, they're like, no, we just won't let you, we just won't have you work with kids. So, yeah. Any other questions? I've got kind of a, a vague question that I haven't worked out in my head yet. But if, uh, so for any kind of massive online course MOOC type thing, <laughs> or a website that might have a bunch of those, if they're not using these nicer methods, but the nicer methods give better results, is this more from a cost of turning a course into one of these nicer methods or is it upkeep on them or, or mm -hmm. something else entirely? So there's definitely a cost portion to that. Um, Here's where I'm gonna get myself into hot water for being opinionated. The X MOOC, so the things like, that you would think of as Coursera as an example or edX, those types of MOOCs, because um, there are two types. We're gonna talk about those ones. Um, the short version is they thought they could read, well, no, I'm not gonna say that. Um, they ignored 25 plus years of research when setting those up. And they basically took the in-class model of I'm going to lecture at you and add some activities in and create it from there. 
they've improved since then. They have things like auto graders. Um, they've added in some features, but I just don't even think they considered it. They didn't do the background work and they basically just made, uh, we're going to push a bunch of content to you and you can do some programming exercises on your own that we have an auto grader that will check the output of your assignment. Now I'm being a little flip that some of them do check, like, did you use um, the, so I, I did the first one, Endering's first one on um, ML and they, it did actually check to make sure that you were using like the vector version for some of them if they told you to do that so that you were doing it following certain conventions when they asked you to. But it's really painful to set up those auto graders. Um, I know Chris Brooks, basically, he's at Michigan. And when they set that up for their data science one, he basically lost all of September and most of October to fixing the auto graders when things went wrong. And you have thousands of students who are sending you like unhappy messages because your auto graders have problems. So there is a big cost to them. Um, the other type of MOOCs, um, connectivist MOOCs or CMOOCs, they in rely entirely on human perception for adaptation and any kind of support. So what they do is they repurpose all different kinds of technologies like Twitter, other social media, Facebook, whatever, and let the students basically almost run wild. <laughs> it's a little bit of an exaggeration and they actually predate the, the other big MOOCs, like the, the ones that you're thinking of. Um, CMOOC started around 2008, I think. Athabasca University um, and George Siemens was the first to do those kind of MOOCs. And they had really, like they had really diverse wide enrollments. But it's not, so those that type of MOOC is problematic for students who aren't good at managing their own learning. Um, because of the lack of structure in it, and because it's dependent on students following some set of instructions across multiple platforms, it ends up being really hard for a lot of learners to do. Whereas the advantage of the X MOOCs is it's very highly structured. Now they're integrating things like peer grading and that kind of thing to get around issues where they don't have auto graders for say essays. <laughs> Um, although I'm sure they're moving in it, they may, they may have integrated that. I'm not, I'm not closely following the feature development on Coursera or edX. The cool thing about edX is um, they allow you to program and integrate in whatever you want. They have, they call it a mooclet. 20 years ago, it would have been called a learning object, whatever, who cares? Um, but you can basically program these little modules that you can plug in to um, into the MOOC and into the edX platform. Coursera is enabling more of that now, but initially Coursera was much more constrained in what they would allow you to do. Okay, thanks. Does that mean we're moving on? I think it's safe. <laughs> All right. Um, so one thing I wanted to kind of warn you about, um, I just want to paste something into the chat, is when I was going through your proposals, keep in mind that I study the effect of AI on people. So I am coming at this from I don't have deep background in RL. I, I have like, I have a high level conceptual understanding of RL, but it's really high level. <laughs> so I was only looking and could only judge what was written on the page. So I was, I'm a knowledgeable reader. I'm the type of person you would end up randomly with on your committee, asking you questions about methods because that's all I can really ask questions about because I don't know RL deep enough for those of you who did things that were really RL intensive in your description. Um, so a lot of my feedback kind of comes from that. The big things that I saw, um, which are challenges, and these are things that everyone has to work on, I still have to work on. <laughs> it's something we all have to be aware of, are the alignment between the methods and whatever your research questions or hypotheses are. And by alignment, I mean the consistency. So if you're saying you're going to ask, um, you wanna find out if people like the color red best, 
then your methods better relate to whether or not people like the color red and how much they like it. Um, so that was one of the challenges I saw across many um, of the things. There were subtle differences in the language use that were probably unintentional, but that made them seem like the goal and what you were actually describing weren't necessarily consistent. And Matt's face suggests that that might not be the case, and it could be that he has more RL background than I do. <laughs> and that's okay. So um, make sure that those things are really, really closely linked and really clearly consistent with one another. The other thing I noticed, and many of you are master's students or don't have a lot of experience with writing things like hypotheses and research questions, and even if you've read a lot of computer science papers, we often don't explicitly put this in the paper. It's often implied through our methods. Um, I mean, it could be wrong. Maybe in ML they state the hypothesis a lot more explicitly. Am I wrong? Yeah, it's here and there. <laughs> You're muted, Matt. Yes, it depends. Um, and, and a lot of it um, is, you know, because we, we want to it, it, drill down and investigate this one little thing and then make these big claims about what it's actually going to, to tell us or enable in the future. And there's, there's a bit of storytelling there, uh, which people do more or less of. Um, the other question I had, and I saw this in one case, and I know in the NLP course last year, we went on a whole tirade about this. <laughs> um, but in the areas you submit to, when someone writes a sentence and, um, you know what, I'm just going to type it in. I'm putting my keyboard over. I'd abandoned my keyboard for my notebook. Um, one. Uh, is this okay? the in, and then you use the citation as like the subject. Citations should never be subjects unless so, you're too close to the deadline and you ha don't have time to fix it. <laughs> yeah, stuff always creeps in. Um, so that's kind of where I'm at too, but some in some disciplines, this is okay. And that's why I was asking. So I know I commented on some of them for this, um, but since Matt also says it's not okay, not okay. And I provided an example of how to restructure the sentence when I noticed that. I didn't always comment on it. Um, did I talk about precision of hypotheses or did I get sidetracked when we were talking about stating hypotheses directly? I got sidetracked. Okay. Um, so one of the things is there were some really good attempts at hypotheses and a few people did a really nice job of them. But we want um, we want our hypotheses to be really precise. So where Matt was talking about, we're looking at this really small thing, the hypothesis should make that clear. It should make things like what you're measuring clear, what your comparison points are clear. And if you go to the link that I provided, and I also sent these to Matt, I'm not sure if you'd shared them already. There's a couple of different links on setting up research questions and hypotheses, and they actually have templates in there. Um, Hypotheses are something you can test. Research questions are things you answer. Sometimes you'll have both in a paper. Often you'll only have one, but it depends a bit on what you're doing. Um, for some of you, I think I suggested that the way you'd written it suggested to me that you might be using mixed methods. Like you might be doing some additional analyses that were perhaps more qualitative than statistical. But that wasn't necessarily, it was something that was suggested to me rather than made really clear and explicit. Because I read a lot of qualitative work, <laughs> I often look for people explicitly saying what perspective they're approaching a problem from. Now, I know in machine learning, that's not generally done. But if you're doing anything that isn't strictly statistical, I would recommend to put that framing in. And your job is essentially to educate your reviewers. So you have to put in why you're using this method. You're going to have to describe the method in more detail than you probably see it described in venues where they do a lot of qualitative work if you're looking at an example of the method um, and justify it. Justify, justify, justify. <laughs> Um, reviewers get upset when they don't understand 
why you did something. Instructors are no different. You want to make anyone who's reading your paper, they want to know why, not just what you did, but why. Because the methodological choices you made might make sense in your context, but if you don't give us that information, we're, we come in with our own assumptions and we're like, well, that's just dumb. Why didn't they do X? So tell us why so that we're on the same page as you. It'll In the long run, it'll make your life easier. It takes a little more work to get there though. Basically, I remember, um, I guess this was when I was doing my undergrad thesis. We were in the room and we'd done our presentations and our defenses because they were joined everyone at the same time. And one of the instructors said, you're not here to communicate, you're here to prevent miscommunication. That is the point of your writing. That is the point of your presentation. And it, it's a different perspective. Essentially, you're, it's the same thing, right? <laughs> Clearly communicating something and preventing someone from misunderstanding it, high level, same diff. But if you approach it from the perspective of you want to make sure it's not misinterpreted, you're actually going to write differently. The first time you write it, just write it, do your first draft, write it as messy as you want, then go back and fix it. Get the idea out first, then go fix it. And pass it to people who are from outside your area or especially outside your lab. For the AI people, there are so many of you, it's really easy to just switch off with someone else who's in a different group because the people in your group have heard it so many times, they have the same assumptions you do. So they aren't gonna catch the things that other people will. So I'm a huge fan of pairing off and sending it. When I was doing my PhD, we set up a writing group. Um, there were four of us. One was AI, one was technically in engineering, I was HCI, and then one was strictly education. With no quantitative CS training, we were all doing educational technology and we all traded off our chapters and gave feedback. And I, Negotiating those differences and figuring out where the misunderstandings were made my final defense so unbelievably easy. <laughs> and I had people from all different disciplines on my defense. But even if you have people from different areas of computer science, which you'll have at least probably one, well, some of the AI people might only have AI people. There are enough of you. <laughs> but being able to talk across those differences and understand them and answer questions that in a way where you're not making assumptions around the question so that you're answering the wrong thing, I think that's a really valuable skill. And it will just generally help you with your communication and writing. Um, questions around that before I move on to argumentative writing. <laughs> I was like, oh no, Carrie's going to go on a tirade. I can just see how to say it. Okay, so generally I thought things flowed well and the arguments mostly made sense. I thought the structure of the arguments could be improved a bit. And I know a lot of people aren't trained in argumentative writing, but scientific writing is essentially you're writing an argument. Any paper you write, that is what you're doing. You are presenting an argument. So what I've put in this document is some links to um, a basic argument structure or method. It's the Tolman method. And it consists of five parts. Your claim, that's whatever you want the reader to believe. So the sky is blue, the sky is green. The claim, it doesn't matter how fa whether it's factual, it's what you want them to believe. And then your job is to write everything else in a way that supports that. Now you're doing scientific writing, so I want that claim to be factual. I want it to be something that you can actually show is true. Um, and then you have grounds. So that's any evidence that could be citations. That could be your data. So whatever your results are, that's if So if you're gonna say RL method A is better than RL method B, that's your claim. And then you've done some machine learning and you've done the t-test or whatever appropriate statistical analysis because the t-test might not be appropriate. Um, and the results of that t-test are what support that claim. That, those are your grounds. The warrants are the link between those things. So if it's, that, if it's direct, as direct as A is better than B because our experiment showed it, see table three, you don't need a warrant because that, that link is really direct. But if, you're, if it's not as direct as that, you're going to have to put additional argumentation in, possibly examples. Um, so backing, justification, 
in order to support that claim and convince your reader that what you're wanting them to believe is believable. Because that's really what it comes down to. Any paper you write, if the reviewers don't believe it, if your reader doesn't believe it, it's going to fail. Um, and then there's this other part, and this is the part that I find gets missed the most when I'm reviewing papers. And obviously you wouldn't have had it um, probably in your proposals. I wouldn't have expected this in the proposals, but I'm covering it now because it'll help you more in the future. It's the rebuttal. Anytime you have data, there is almost always an alternative interpretation of what might be leading to it, um, why you saw that effect, or an entirely different interpretation of um, what that data could even mean, depending on the analyses you perform. So the rebuttal, and it's not the best name for it, but that's what they call it, um, is where you acknowledge alternative interpretations. So at a minimum, you want to acknowledge those alternative interpretations. If you have the data to support it, then you can argue for why that alternative interpretation doesn't apply. You may not have that opportunity, but if you can, that makes your argument far stronger. And that helps support whatever your interpretation is better. And that's a tricky thing to do. Could you give a concrete example of that? Because I'm I'm used to you know saying well my my line is above the other guy's line and it's uh, statistically significant at the ninety five percent level uh, so I'm better. Yeah. Um, so the study where we deployed a system in Japan, we did evaluations of students' vocabulary knowledge, and this was our independent measure of whether or not they learned. There were two phases to the study. In the first phase, they were doing worksheets. In the second phase, they were preparing presentations um, that they would give in class. We saw learning in the first phase and not in the second. Now, language learning theory would suggest that we should have seen larger gains in the second when they were preparing presentations because they were working effortfully through the language. So one of the so when we saw the larger gain in the first one, um, the one potential interpretation is they just didn't do the work in the second half. Like they just didn't do it, but we had the evidence that they'd done the work. Um, from some of what we observed and some of the mistakes we saw in the work they did, what it was suggestive of is they handed it off to whoever in their group already had high English proficiency and they did it or to create the content they were supposed to create, they did it in Japanese, put it into Google Translate and used that. So they weren't doing the effortful processing, but if we just looked at the number results, we wouldn't have been able to address those counter arguments and they the, the whole thing would have been, well, your study was fundamentally flawed. That's not it. We couldn't enforce that students did what they were supposed to do. And then we went and did an analysis of the worksheets they did and observations we had from that to support that they were doing much more effortful processing there. We saw them working in groups and collaborating and arguing about the meaning of words, which is known to support learning, but we weren't expecting that in the first half of the term. So then we had to address all of the potential interpretations of their behavior and everything else to deal with that. It's been a while since I looked at the paper that was, I did that study six years ago, so the details are a little fuzzy. Yeah, but that that helps. Um, I guess I'm I'm wondering. So in in a real world setting, there will always be these kind of con there's likely to be these kind of confounding factors and and other things that are happening that you're not anticipating. I'm just wondering if in a, a very carefully controlled machine learning experiment, if there if there are going to be cases where no, it's it's there's pretty much it, it either worked or it didn't, and your evidence showed it worked. Or can, um, can you? Yeah. Yeah, in a lab setting, it's a little harder. I like the real world, it's messy and fun. I, I, I actually kind of like the mess. <laughs> I find it interesting. Most people don't and most computer scientists don't and that's okay. Everybody likes different things. Um, I think if you have a human in the loop, there's always the potential for things to go sideways. And there will always be the potential that you'll need to explain counter arguments. Um, there, depending on the methods you're using, it might not be as clear to explain the results of the model. So let's say I'm doing essay scoring. One of them 
is a deep learning approach that was trained with qualitative human rubrics. Another was just with output score. Um, one of them performs better than the other. I need to explain potentially why, or we have this really simple word count actually performs incredibly well. Useless from a giving feedback perspective, but highly predictive of score. Um, so then you need to explain why that might be. Now that's gonna be really hard with some, a really deep model um, because you, the explainability of those features, and I know it's an active area of research, but the explainability of those re um, features can be difficult. So depending on the methods you're using, it might not even be possible. And the reasons behind something, you may have a list of four or five that are informed by theory and you have to walk through them and provide the different interpretations. And you might not be able to address all the counter arguments, but you can at least walk through why those may apply or why they may not and say, this is an open question. We need to figure out a way to see which of those things is actually at play. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so I was just remembering one of, one of my pet peeves was how uh, people in, in RL machine learning papers will often say, my method works, you know, my, my method is better than, than the existing one. And okay, great. Why? You know, you, you just added four new things, what's affecting what, so you can get by with some ablation studies that can help. Um, but just saying that it works and I can't really explain it. That's pretty unsatisfying. And the other, the other failure mode is people often say, well, my, my wet food works for these reading reasons in, uh, and we tested in video games A and B. It's like, okay, great. Your method works better than these other two. Maybe you have some insight into why, where else will this be true? Is your method always going to be better? Well, sometimes it'll be worse. Where would it be worse? And, and many people seem to kind of ignore those. Yeah, talking about kind of transferability, generalizability, the context in which things apply, that's super important. I know um, in the user modeling community, they're like, we don't care if your model succeeds or fails. If you can't explain why it fails, it's of little use to us. They're, like, they're just like, who cares? <laughs> um, so I think you see differences there disciplinarily, but it's also, it's always more interesting when you understand the why or where something might apply, like how far you might be able to take it. And all of our models are limited. They all only apply in certain settings. So we need to understand what other settings by analogy we might be able to try them in. And that doesn't mean we don't test them in that new setting before actually putting them into a system that would affect real people but it means it gives us information about what might be worth putting that effort into testing. Yeah, that's a great way of putting it. I like the transferability or generalizability because right now our reinforcement learning is obsessed with Atari games. We don't care about performing well in breakout. That is not the end goal, but we are using it as a proxy for, for problems we do care about. And sometimes it seems like people lose sight of that that if, if they can show their method works better in breakout, that means success. Um, that's kind of also one of the interesting things around the user modeling community. A lot of it started in educational domains because it's sufficiently constrained that you could make progress on a lot of really tough user modeling type problems. And then you saw the expansion outside of that where in this constraint setting, we can do it now. How do we make it so we can expand it to things like product recommendations or movie recommendations? So there's interesting work and crossover that way. So the main user modeling conference, you end up with these two really weird streams, like half of it is educational technology. And then half of it are these base, usually commercial recommender systems. Not all of them are fully commercial recommender systems. Um, but it's just this interesting interplay across the two. I, I could guess those uh, groups might have different opinions, standards, and access to funding. Um, at the HRI conference, Human Robot Interaction, you get the roboticists, you get the psychologists, and in many cases, there's a huge gap between them. There's just these two types of research that they prefer. Um, and I, and that's an ongoing discussion. I, should, it, should this actually be two conferences? Well, no, we'd really like to find stuff in the middle and trying to get that kind of work that is appreciated by both communities can be that much harder. 
It is. So um, the artificial intelligence and education community, which is where our intelligent tutoring systems are, kind of has a bit of that divide. Um, initially, the conference AI Ed was only held every other year. It's every year now. But it's pretty much half psychology, half computer science. There's a smattering of others. Um, but when they started, they also then branched off and made this other one, International Conference on the Learning Sciences. And you get a lot more of the very psychology focused research there, but you still get crossover between the two. So we still have the crossover, but just naturally because of interests and fiefdoms, we wound up with both. Um, and then you get a bit more computer science stuff at AI Ed, but there's still a really heavy psychology presence there. Yeah, hope, hopefully smart people are studying the evolution of these kinds of groups. Because I, I, I'd be very interested in trying to understand how and why the NeurIPS conference uh, became what's what's called the Super Bowl of the machine learning world. You know how how did it be, how did it, the the power change over the you know thirty years it's been going on from it being this niche thing to being the most prestigious one, and what effect that actually has on the science. Totally not my area. That seems like an interesting sociology study. So I guess there seems to be a bit of dead air here. Maybe I'll try and jump in with a question. Um, so with rebuttals, um, so some work that I've submitted in the past, I've highlighted what I thought were, I guess, what's the way to put this? potential arguments against the work. It's not as direct as a rebuttal and it's more, so maybe I'll put it more concretely. I was using some generator, generative language stuff to produce uh, training data for an algorithm. And I originally did the study with a five-fold cross-validation. So I was worried that there would be leakage across the folds because with the generative approach, I can't guarantee what words are going into what fold, depending on how it generated the data. So I put that into the paper and every reviewer out of the three said, well, it doesn't count because there's leakage across the folds. And I was like, well, yeah, but I, I said that. <laughs> so I'm kind of a little bit scarred and I'm kind of reluctant to keep doing that in the future. Cause it's like, hey, reviewer, point out where I did it wrong. <laughs> Yeah, that can, that's definitely a challenge and doing the rebuttal aspect is, um, it's a bit of an art form and it is a risk. Um, where it's less of a risk is in like the discussion conclusion section than in the methods. But like, so I do a lot of human subject stuff, almost all human subject stuff. And you're supposed to report dropout. So if you have participants who start and don't finish, you're supposed to report that. I have had reviewers tear me apart for reporting that. And they're like, well, the study was fundamentally flawed, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, no, people got tired. Like people just quit sometimes. All they, like literally, literally they were recording themselves reading Alice in Wonderland. Not a hard thing to do. It wasn't a problem with the study. So we had to recruit other people who reported it. And you'd get these really weird kind of backhanded compliments where reviewers are like, people really should report this, but and it's like, so we had to work around that. We, we had to submit it a couple of times because that wound up being um, the crit what they felt was a critical flaw for a couple of submissions. We got into a better venue eventually, whatever. Um, you keep working through it. Um, as a grad student, that's a little harder <laughs> to do. Sometimes if you have work like that, and I don't normally recommend, especially master's students aim for journal articles, just because of the timeline around them. But when work is potentially more controversial like that, doing journal submissions can be better because the process is a little different. So for most conferences, you submit, you get reviews and a decision. Some conferences have a rebuttal stage. Often it doesn't really make a big difference. Once in a while it does, but usually, I, I have seen people go from reject to best paper nominations on rebuttal. It's rare, it's incredibly rare. It's my example of you should bother with the rebuttal, <laughs> but generally it doesn't really make a di difference. Um, whereas with the journal, because you end up with this more conversation with between you and the reviewers, 
Um, you can work through some of those things and they'll help you to massage the text in a way that makes it okay or where they better understand it. And then you figure out what their underlying real concern is or what they've misunderstood in a way so that you can improve it. So if you have riskier stuff, I tend to go journal route. And, and that conversation can evolve over time and you come to a shared experience and the article is better for it. Or in some cases, people just start yelling at each other and you go to a different journal. Um, I, yeah. So I want to be respectful for everyone's time. Carrie, thank you so much for coming and talking to us today. This is awesome. This is this is the kind of content that I myself need to learn much more about. And I'm excited to find more ways of both learning about it and working with you in the future, because this, this kind of stuff is exactly what is missing from not just my own work, but a, a lot of work in interactive machine learning. So thank you so much. Thank you, Matt. Um, I look forward to working with you too. I'd like to thank everyone for great questions. Um, you clearly thought about stuff, so that's really good too. Um, that's always nice to see when you come in and there are lots of questions. So much better than when there's silence. Great, so like normal, being engaged. I'm, I'm gonna turn off the recording now. <laughs>